Magandang araw po. Uh, ako po si uh, Sandy Flor. And uh, I will be presenting uh, part of uh, the Media and Technology Literacy for Accreditors series of TVUP. Uh, today, we will talk about alternative assessment. Alternative assessment. But uh, I need to give a disclaimer before I start. Okay. The views and opinions expressed herein do not represent the entire spectrum of thought on assessment within the UP Open University, within the UP system, or the open education community in general. They do not apply to basic education, to technical education, or even to general education, where curricular content and pedagogy follow agreed upon standards. Uh, the inflated grades phenomenon, which we will talk about, is a recent development or construct, and it is yet to be studied rigorously and discussed comprehensively before it may be addressed effectively. So this presentation does not, does not and cannot claim that there is a quick fix to this particular uh, problem. Nabanggit ko na po yung great inflation, ano po? A friend of mine who was awarded a summa cum laude, no? described it as trivializing Sumas or trivializing Latin honors. No? Imagine you po, no, I come from UP Los Baños originally, and our first summa cum laude was awarded to Dr. Obdulius Season right after the war. And it took uh, something like 30 years before the next summa cum laude, Dr. Shilito Habito, was uh, given that award. And then followed a series of uh, sumas, including uh, Lisbeth de Padua, our former uh, Miss Philippines. No? But today, today, or during the last graduation, uh, UP Los Manos had 23 summa cum laudes. And that dwarfed the Diliman figure, which is 300 plus plus. Okay? Now, is it really trivializing sumas? Uh, is it really grade inflation? Uh, what are its causes? This phenomenon universally observed among UP constituent units and other Philippine higher education institutions uh, happened during the migration to remote learning from academic years 2020 to 2021 and 2021 to 2022. And uh, there was a, this significant increase of Latin honors recipients, a significant increase of GWAs among students, a decrease in mortality and attrition rates, despite the di disruption that uh, the lockdowns uh, caused. And there was an indicative increased effectiveness in teaching. Was it an indicative increased effectiveness in teaching? Or is this indicative of a drop in UP's academic standards or the entire higher educational uh, community? Is it indicative of a drop in our academic standards? Uh, does this undermine the university system's efforts in quality assurance? Diba? Especially when we are now uh, in this uh, scramble for uh, ranking, right? Uh, does it undermine our uh, efforts in quality assurance? Is it a wicked problem, so to speak? You know, a problem that is here to stay. Okay, now uh, let us try to explain it through a problematic. Uh, I would imagine that there are subordinate influential factors, you know, uh, direct causal uh, links between well, certain factors in this problem, and there are superordinate influential factors or root causes. Okay, and uh, let me give you my analysis. Academic dishonesty is this uh, an influential factor given the uh, fact that students now uh, study at home, the exams are administered when they are at home. Is there academic dishonesty in the picture? Were students, given the fact that they were uh, studying at home, they had heightened focus on the academic requirements. They were just there at home. 
So they had to concentrate on their academic requirements. This could be one of the causes, right? Or there may have been increased time and resources. Imagine the savings that families had during that time. Uh, no expenses on transportation, on uniforms, on makeup for the girls, on papogi for the boys, okay? So uh, they had increased resources. Uh, even the university saved a lot during that time. No electricity bills or uh, minimal electricity, water bills, utility bills, Wi-Fi bills, and so on. Okay. Uh, and there was really time to do these things. So this may have caused the so-called phenomenon of great inflation. And definitely, particularly in the UP system, during that time, there was a flexibility in the satisfaction of academic requirements, prompted by this feeling of compassion towards the circumstances and the situation of uh, the studentry. Or we could also say that there may have been some ambivalence to academic standards at that particular time, even among the faculty. You know, pinababayaan na lang natin, oh, okay na to, pwede na to, bigyan na lang natin ng mas malaking grade. Now, uh, these, to me, may have been direct causes to the problem. You may or may not disagree. But I also offer a number of possible root causes to this. First is uh, the suspension of uh, grading policies has led to uh, ambivalence in academic standards, maybe and uh, increased flexibilities in the satisfaction of academic requirements. Or, yes, I mentioned this a while back, compassion among the faculty, which uh, was no less, quote-unquote, legislated in a number of uh, memoranda from our academic affairs uh, management. And then remote learning arrangements also I believe is a superordinate influential factor. During uh, remote learning, as uh, I uh, stated a while back, uh, you would have more resources, more time to do your schoolwork. And definitely the shift in delivery modes from face-to-face -to, -face to online contributed to this. And uh, universally adopted assessment models and assumptions that were no longer applicable to online learning may have led to this problem, you know, to grade inflation. These are universally adopted assessment models and assumptions which were inappropriate to the given situation. Okay, so I will uh, focus on the following, on the last uh, two uh, that I mentioned, shift in delivery modes, and the universally adopted assessment models and assumptions. Since as uh, program accreditors, we would need to be sensitive to uh, developments such as this in our environment and how it impinges upon the quality that we look for uh, when accrediting programs. Now, I, I've, uh, I've used this analogy a number of times that uh, the uh, educational system is like a bed with four posts, you know, four posts. Uh, I'm referring, of course, to the components of the educational system, not the subsystems within uh, the educational system itself, because the subsystem would include the faculty, the students, uh, the university, and so on. I'm referring to the components uh, in an educational system, which are the delivery system, the curriculum, the pedagogy and assessment. Now, uh, I have been saying for a number of times now that if we change the dimension or if we change one of these uh, components, there is a need to change the others. Imagine if you decrease the length of one of these posts by only half an inch or maybe even less than that, would you be able to sleep comfortably? Definitely not. Okay. So there are adjustments needed on the other three posts, you know, equivalent adjustments. Now, what we did during the lockdowns was that we changed the delivery system without attempting to revise the curriculum, the pedagogy, 
and most importantly, the assessment. Okay. So this may have led to the uh, inflated grades uh, phenomenon and the subsequent increase of our, uh, the number of sumas. Okay, we have changed three. Uh, we have changed three system elements or components, but retained one. Well, maybe we did change uh, part of the curriculum based on the the delivery system. For instance, we did. We we uh, had a number of uh, module writing uh, exercises, right? That uh, was true to all uh, our uh, higher educational institutions, and we also attempted to shift our pedagogy, but we retained the assessment and that led to the problem, I believe. Now, <clears throat> I would like to show you uh, a service that was being offered in uh, the internet. I think this was circa 2010, 2011, when there was this advertisement. We take your class. No? We take your online classes for you and you get a, a grade of A. Now, <laughs> this is a 9173104695 uh, number, but this is not uh, a globe number. This is not a Philippine-based uh, service. But imagine that uh, a service such as this is being advertised over the internet. It was subsequently pulled down, uh, but then, uh, there may have been a demand for something like this. And we are proposing this analysis on how uh, this, uh, such, a, such a, a phenomenon may occur. There is a disconnect between delivery, pedagogy, and assessment. Okay? There are certain contradictions uh, in the delivery pedagogy assessment uh, that uh, we are employing in uh, our technology mediated classroom okay and uh, we find that in this superordinate influential factors this the distance mode the technology itself you know a cyber psychological factors and social cultural factors I will give you uh, a number of uh, instances. Now we are talking, of course, of academic dishonesty, cheating, plagiarism, classwork by proxy, ghostwriting, okay, and others. And then there is cyberbullying among our online students. And there is also, you know, the tendency to cut corners, you know, uh, I, I call this the g gamer's agenda. You know, if you're a gamer, you look for so-called cheats. You know, if you're a Dota a gamer or uh, uh, let's say you do League of Legends or Arcane, you look for cheats in the game. Something that could uh, accelerate your progress, okay? But uh, they are called uh, cheats. The mere fact that we, we offered courses online changed, uh, I believe, substantively uh, the game, okay? And it led to certain inappropriate assessment models or, yes, inappropriate assessment models uh, applied to distance learning, okay, led to cheating. And uh, this is what I call the open and distance e-learning uh, problematic. Uh, technology likewise may have contributed to that because the distance between the the teacher and the learner is you know is is is, is uh, quite substantial that's why it's called remote learning okay. there is also this adversarial relationship between teacher and learner this is uh, a mindset that we automatically assume when uh, teaching certain classes, you know, uh, the, our, our students have a, a tendency to cheat. That is a mindset that I think we could do away without. Okay? And uh, there are cyber psychological factors such as cutting corn that led to cutting corners, 
and uh, the gamer's agenda. So all of this, uh, this is, of course, how I explain uh, this phenomenon. And, uh, uh, well, it's, it, it may be contentious to some. Bigger view of uh, this. The subordinate influential factors would be cheating, inappropriate assessment models, adversarial relationship between teacher and learner, the gamer's agenda, cutting corners, and so on, leading to this problematic situation. But uh, the superordinate or root causes would be distance, technology, cyber psychological factors, social cultural factors. Again, uh, this is one person's view of uh, how this may occur. But I'd like to dwell on the so-called self-perpetuating adversarial system, the mindset that I referred to earlier. And uh, the GPA system may be the main <laughs> element in this. In our GPA system uh, that we adopted during the lockdown period, that we still adopted, now, which by definition should be guided by open education uh, philosophies during that time. Applying conventional grading systems in a situation where teacher and learner are separated and has access to technologies, remember that uh, a student uh, may refer to any source. You know, any source could be a mouse click away uh, uh, during online learning. So measures of cognitive gain may no longer be appropriate nor accurate given these circumstances. So instilling uh, GPA or grade point average primacy among online learners also uh, may have been inappropriate within the uh, technology mediated learning environment, particularly in higher education. So if, if we, this is the message or the signal that we give to our students that, you know, you aim for this GPA. So uh, they target the number, you know, and not the learning itself. Conventional assessment models give rise to oppositional or adversarial relationships between teachers and students, which in turn influence students to see the online classroom as perhaps an arena for for a game you know okay i will engage uh in a game with my teacher and i will look for cheats in the learning management system and i will win this could be the dialogue that is happening in uh, the person's mind students are encouraged to adopt a gamer's agenda to look for cheats within the system so we engage in this cat and mouse game you know, and uh, a preoccupation of both teachers and students perennially sacrificing the quality of learning and instruction. As uh, program accreditors of educational uh, offerings within this new digital environment, we have to be sensitive to this uh, problematic, so to speak, and we uh, have to see how it may be entangled. I have a couple of suggestions here. First is that we should have a policy for, uh, for uh, technology-mediated instruction, okay? uh, specifically for higher education, for technical vocational education, and possibly for non-formal education. But we need to discourage the use of uh, technology-mediated instruction in basic education. Now, uh, I know that this is, you know, this is an alternative that ought to be considered given the different disruptions that we have. Now, these could be natural disasters, this could be pandemics, or, or even, uh, even uh, wars or so on. But as much as possible, we should discourage the use of uh, technology-mediated instruction in basic education, where I think face-to-face uh, -face instruction is still most effective. 
And then we should consider authentic assessment policies for technology-mediated education. We should rethink our assessment approach, adopt authentic assessment with several assessment levels. You know. uh, we should also divorce a formal assessment from instruction. What do we mean by this? Uh, have we ever considered a third-party assessment or industry-based assessment, meaning the assessments that to be conducted on our students, the tests, will be done by a third party. They're doing this in TESTA and in technical vocational education. You know, uh, it would be the industry itself would be uh, doing, would be assessing our students. Okay. Now, uh, Odell policy and practice generally consistent with openness, independence, and constructivism. The shift to, uh, the shift in delivery systems, as I said earlier, necessitates a shift in pedagogy okay. and uh, this is why we should adopt we we should adopt sorry open education independent learning and constructivism you know, uh, as pillars in uh, our pedagogy now this question how can we offer a course without a teacher giving a numerical grade Consider the fact that grades did not always exist. Okay. There were hundreds of years of history uh, um, among universities in Europe, for instance, where, when, when grades were not awarded. Uh, the roots of the university date back in 6th century Europe. And the first uh, was the University of Bologna, founded in... Uh, 1,088, and uh, students' performance then were not graded. Grades were instituted just three centuries ago by European universities that fostered competitions among students for prizes and uh, rank order. And uh, consider the following alternatives. Narrative assessments instead of sit-down tests. Peer assessments, you know, assessments among uh, the students themselves, third party assessments, as I, I mentioned earlier, and authentic assessments. Uh, and we've been doing this exam uh, in uh, the UP Open University. Now, let's talk about third party assessments some more. Okay. Uh, in, in third party assessments, assessment is not uh, done by the teacher. Uh, nor the learner or, or, or fellow learners. And uh, these are, are the methods. Okay? There, there are tests. Uh, scored tests are also used by a third party. And um, the students are asked to demonstrate or to simulate. Yeah. There is a narrative assessment when uh, the assessment itself, the assessment exercise, would be like a conversation between the student and the third party. The third party could be uh, contracted by the university or it may be an office within the university which is not uh, involved in instruction. Okay. And portfolio assessment is another uh, means or technique. The student uh, c or collects a portfolio or compiles a portfolio of his work and at the end of uh, the program, he or she would submit it for the assessment of this third party. We could also say that internal uh, third party assessment could be internal, as I said, within the higher educational institution. Another office independent from the faculty conducts the assessment. Or it could be external assessments conducted by a government body. Okay. By PRC, for instance, if they would have the organization and the manpower to do it. Assessments conducted by accredited institutions or uh, industry itself, industry representatives, industry employed uh, assessors, and uh, even employers themselves. These are the advantages as I see it. Okay. We have institutional advantages, 
curricular advantages and advantages in terms of function. Okay? And uh, I included three columns here, academe, industry, student. What are the institutional advantages for the academe? The academy will have a more meaningful partnership with industry if we have uh, industry-led or third-party assessment. The industry will have greater involvement in the educational system. And uh, the student, uh, well, uh, the assessments uh, that the student undergoes will truly uh, define him. In terms of curricula, uh, university offerings become more relevant. And uh, the uh, industry, the curricula would be more responsive to industry needs. And students will have access to genuine capacity development since what they will be uh, learning are very relevant to the demands of the industry. In terms of function, faculty members can focus on generating and sharing new knowledge instead of running after cheaters in the class. Uh, the industry will have access to more qualified students and uh, the students will be better equipped to face the world of work. Okay, so uh, this is just a list of my personal <laughs> assessment practices. Learner-centered decision points, learner participation in populating course content, open-ended semestral calendars. Uh, I'm averse at administering synchronous written final examinations, uh, which are either objective or narrative exams. And we adopt uh, alternatives for calibrated grading, we should focus on metacognitive outcomes instead of cognitive and behavioral objectives. What we mean by this is we should teach the students to learn how to learn in the current educational environment. You know? So their engagement in learning activities matter more than their performance. Okay, I would repeat that their engagement in learning activities matter more than their performance or their grades. 